we're going to look at this thermodynamically. We already know how to calculate energy changes for isothermal and adiabatic expansion from our lectures in Polito's lecture four. Now this is a cycle. So this is a pressure volume diagram. You're starting up here, goes down here, goes up there, and you end up there. So since the cycle, if we look at it, one Carnot cycle, the change in internal energy is zero. And the change in internal energy is the heat transferred to the system in this step, that step, that step, and that step. Each one of those four steps, there's some heat transfer to the system, and there's also some work done on or by the system. One, two, three, four, those are the four steps. And that's equal to zero. Let's look in more detail this pressure volume graph for uh, the Carnot cycle. Again, isothermal, adiabatic, isothermal, adiabatic. Pressure volume graph. I remember from isothermal, the relationship between P and V is P1 V, V1 is equal to P2 V2. And remember for adiabatic, it was P1 V1 raised to the gamma power is equal to P2 V2 raised to the gamma power, where gamma, remember, was the ratio of heat capacities, heat capacity constant pressure over heat capacity at constant volume. So that means that for the isothermal, we're going to start right up here. Uh, let's say this is point A. This is just a PV. Now, when we switch from isothermal to adiabatic to make this point B, we see that since gamma is greater than 1, in other words, the heat capacity at constant pressure is greater than the heat capacity at constant volume, that means that P will decrease faster than you expect because now the x-axis here is being raised to a power. So now instead of keep going down there, it'll go a little faster. This is point C. Then the this is the first, this is the second step. The third step is isothermal. So again, you're having this relationship. PV is a constant here. It goes up like this to point D. And then finally, adiabatic, again, you get a bigger dependence of P on V go something like this. All right, so that's uh, supposed to supposed to look like this graph here. So we understand that. All right, so that's the pressure volume work, uh, pressure volume. Now let's see what kind of work can be done here. Well, maybe it's obvious that the amount of work done is the area inside this PV curve. So recall that in the first case, when you have expansion, the system is doing work on the surroundings. There's that under here, and then when the system is contracting, the, the this is doing work on the uh, system, the surroundings doing work on the system, so that's that, so you have to subtract these two, so the work done is just the area in this curve. So that's just an application of what we learned in the third and fourth lectures, maybe, uh, to this particular lecture, lecture five. Let's go back here, so let's uh, look at this thermodynamically. Since steps two and four are adiabatic, that means that Q2 and Q4, there's no heat transferred in the second and fourth steps. So that the total Q total, the total heat transferred, is the heat transferred in the first step, isothermal, plus the heat transferred in the third step, isothermal. And the second and fourth are adiabatic. Uh, let's look at the total work. You're doing work on or by the system in both steps, the expansion in both isothermal and adiabatic, you're doing work here, and the compression. So the uh, work term, the total work, has four terms. Work done the first step, second step, third step, plus fourth step. Now since the change in internal energy U is zero, this implies that work total is equal to the total heat transferred, because remember when delta U is zero, the internal energy change is zero, minus W equal Q, this is just equal to Q1 plus Q3. Note that this total work done will be less than zero. In other words, the work done, the total work done, well the PV, this area is a positive number, but remember the work goes as minus PDV, so dW is minus, so don't forget that minus sign. So even though the area is positive, the work is negative. 
but when you put that negative sign in front of it, this total term here has to be greater than zero. So Q1 plus Q3 has to be greater than zero. Now we know that for Q1, for that expansion, okay, for this expansion, heat is flowing into the hot gas. So Q1 is greater than zero. For that first step, heat is flowing into the system, into the engine, so Q is greater than zero. And we know that Q3 is less than zero. Q3 is less than zero because now heat is flowing, no heat flowing in and out. Now heat is flowing from the cool gas to the cool reservoir, so the system is losing energy. So for that third step, Q is less than zero. All right, so what we have is on the left-hand side, you want a number greater than zero. On the right-hand side, you have two numbers. One is greater than zero, one is less than zero. In order to get this term greater than zero, Q1, the positive number, has to be bigger than Q3, the negative number. So this implies that Q1 is greater than Q3. So how much heat you put into the engine is more on an absolute scale. Let me just say this way. Let me put absolute values around here so make sure we know what I'm talking about. So that the absolute value of Q1 is greater than the absolute value of Q3. So the amount of heat you put into the system has to be more than the amount of heat you take out of the system. And that sort of makes sense because you're doing work and that's why the heats are not equal. Put some heat in the system, some of that heat is converted to work and then some of the heat goes out uh, into the cold temperature reservoir.